Okay, so we'll start this special meeting of the Historic Preservation Commission to discuss residential design standards and keep working on our draft. Um, well, I'm not sure if Jim, if you had a chance to look through some other residential guidelines or, or other I haven't. Residential components. I haven't. Where I, I think we left off was at roof parapets and dormers. Is that right? Um, Page 64. We did, but we, we really hadn't, I don't think, cleaned up page 24. Um, and I just wanted to share something. Let me see yeah, if I'll, I'll let you take the lead on this, Kate, and then if I have any questions, I'll jump in. Okay, let me see if I can share my screen here. Um, okay, so I think I press this and do. I have a copy of the guidelines in front of me, just so you know. Um, let me share this. Now, are you sharing? Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, so it says why pre preserve historic buildings or, or neighborhoods. So this was out of the Salt Lake City. Let me see if I can move this over. The Salt Lake, Lake City Preservation Handbook for Historic Residential Properties and Districts in Salt Lake, Lake City. And I thought this was like kind of like a good overview of kind of looking at how we could I'm not sure just the leading part of this is, is really what we want to do. I think this is very cumbersome and maybe onerous for, you know, the residential part. We do want to explain enough, but it's, it's going to be, you know, different. So I'm not sure we don't want to start off with a completely different front end that talks about why you preserve historic buildings in neighborhoods. Um, and then kind of work through some of this language. Um, and then we have a certain archetype of building in the Cayuga area, but then we've already talked about, you know, the um, Evans, Eagle, Orchard, Academy area that has one of the oldest set of housing stock in the village. You know, that is a very different archetype of building than we have on South Cayuga. So, you know, do we want to make this all encompassing or do we plan on, um, uh, you know, modifying this every time we look at a historic district that would be potential to the historic fabric of the village and the form of a district? Um, so, I don't want to reinvent the word we like. Sorry, I was say just going to say that 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 could be um, you know creating an undue burden on yourself and future HPCs to try and you know almost write neighborhood specific standards. I mean, I it's would a agree huge with lift that. to do that from a zoning point of view. I think if right, we can I'm keep this. Right, I'm glad to hear you say this. Yeah, <laughs> no, I think I think we need to we need to kiss this. You know, we need to keep this simple and 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 straightforward and, and user friendly. I agree. Right. So I think I think we we do need to explain why we're doing this. So you know I think um so I just gonna mute that. Um so it looks like chapter two basically goes through some major things that you would deal more with residential structures. I mean, you would deal with these with commercial structures as well, but they're very specific to the types of materials you would find on residential structures, what a homeowner would plan on doing for these as far as like cleaning, repairing, painting, things like that. And then, you know, it, it, it brings out a whole chapter in windows, which seems appropriate because um, that is a major homeowner renovation that happens, you know, very, very often. So we really do need to talk about windows, doors, porches, you know, I think that, I think the consensus of this commission is to really focus our attention on things that are visible from any public right of way. So we've talked about the Cayuga homes, you know, some of them are, are highly visible from the creek. Um, I, I played devil's advocate and I said, you know, 
or even we want to get into that with the, the South Cayuga homes. And the consensus was, I think, unanimous, you know, besides me, that, um, that they wanted to say yes. It was very important of what um, the property structures look like from the island as a public way. So, um, hey, Kate, can I ask you a question? Yep. So yeah. regarding porches, I just thought of this. Um, so I have a house that's got a porch, but I know a lot of the houses, they've closed in the porches. Once we approve right. these guidelines, would they not be able to close in the porches anymore without getting permission from us? Correct. Yes. Correct. Yeah, because see, that's where I think there's a good character that has been lost by Lots of these people wanted more floor space, and so they enclose these porches. Yeah, I mean, that's happened. Um, I mean, my neighbors, both sides, did it. Um, yeah. at the street, a lot of people have done it. Um, it's, it's something that has affected the character of the neighborhoods for sure. Um, yeah. And we've kept ours open we purposely to maintain the architectural history of the, the structure. The same, the same here. It's, it's a really important feature of my house and um, you know, we're, we're trying to keep, we're trying to treat it very sensitively to make sure that it stays within the character of our neighborhood. Can I ask another question as long as um, I'm thinking of it? I mean, another thing we did was instead of replacing our wooden garage doors, we found a, a builder from Chautauqua Institution that built us mm -hmm. identical wooden doors for our garage. If somebody want, had wooden garage doors, would they not be able to replace those again with aluminum unless they check with us first? Yes. Right, this is a change right. of material. Okay, I just want, I'm just trying to clarify some of these. Yeah, and we've seen sort of of appropriateness like that before. Um, okay. In my tenure here. So, I mean, if, if we look at our design standards and and you know something like this that's specific, specifically geared towards residential. I mean, they do. They go through. Here's our intent. Here's the regulatory process. I'm reading from ours now, um, which I can put up on the screen. Um, let's see. And then you know, here's the materials. It seems like the material list was pretty expounded compared to what we have here. It's, well, it's, it's, it's similar, I guess. Masonry, concrete, wood, metals, painting, coatings, color. So we just want to keep it very simple. You know, I don't think you need 13 pages to describe all that, possibly. Um, and then elements like well, the commercial use of residential buildings. And that, that was something I wanted to discuss. I, I, that's why I was hoping for a, a larger consensus here. I mean, we don't even have a quorum. Um, if we're talking commercial use as a residential property or vice versa, I guess, people have talked about the school. I think Jim, you brought up the schoolhouse that is being used residentially. It was not built as a residential structure. We don't know what the end use for um, the castle is going to be. It was built as a residential structure. It, I don't know if it's going to be a residential structure in, in the future. And then also like 75 Evans. 75 Evans we're hoping comes on as a local landmark. Whether we'll have design um, standards approved by then, we, we don't know. So does that somehow get grandfathered or does everything then switch to the residential that is residential and then where is that line of residential being used commercially or commercially being used as residential? Um, okay, so lots of questions there. There is. There is. <laughs> um, and, and I just want to make sure it's all thought through before we right. start on paper. Right. So I'll take the sort of the last one first. The um, my understanding of having design guidelines is that they are easier to adopt and revise and amend over time than if it was um, codified vagaries of state law. So the point is, is that when they're adopted, that's the law of the land that's current at the time. So, you know, let's say 75 Evans comes online as a landmark and they come in for a certificate of appropriateness, they're doing it under the current design standards. It, 
I mean, if, if Christiana's right, then it's, its use is irrelevant. Um, right. So, and then later on, you adopt revised design standards that maybe, let's say they, you know, arguably loosen some of the standards that would otherwise apply to a commercial property. Um, then that's just a benefit to the homeowner and they, they come to you less frequently or whatever might be the case. Um, as far as like the schoolhouse or the castle, now you have sort of an irregular condition in that you're also overlapping on local zoning. So um, the castle can only have certain uses because it's in a residential district. So unless they come and get a spot zoning, local land use, you know, amendment or something to modify their, their function, the, the most commercial that property could ever be would be a home office or an Airbnb. What about museums? Um, I mean, I suspect, I mean, I'll have to look, but I suspect that museum is not something that's a, like a, um, a specified use in a residential district and by, so. it's by absence not. it's ex, it's uh it's kind of like community or something community zoning or something right well, like well we don't have one of those in our, in our neighborhood okay. multiple churches um churches so like, yes okay but it's it but but church is not a museum, and, and so the way the code's written is it specifically indicates what uses are permitted, and then okay. those that are not permitted are therefore, or, or those that are not listed are therefore prohibited. Um, okay. So I, I can look. I don't remember ever seeing the word museum in any of our residential codes. Yeah, Kate, I, I think probably the, the, the catch-all here is the zoning. Uh, I mean, yeah. Matt's totally right. They, they can't do it if it's zoned a certain, for a certain use. Right. Oh, look so, at that. Uh, cultural, cul I stand corrected. Okay. Cultural use facility or museum is actually in the definition. Huh. Interesting. Well, what zoning is this? I don't know yet. That's in the definitions under the zoning code. So it um, it is at least addressed. Whether it's a permitted use, I don't know yet. Um, what were you gonna say, Kate? I'm sorry, I cut you off. Um so the opposite of that, we have a commercial district and MMU yeah, mixed use district down Main Street. And we've you know talked about looking at all of those former residential properties that now um, one story stubs on the front of them built to make them more commercial structures, many of which are still being used either as income properties or by the property owner as their primary residence. Um, so, you know, let's take short street photography. That's just a beautiful building. I, I don't know what the dates are or anything like that. I don't think we've ever studied that building, but I think that there's property owner may live right behind the, the commercial use. Um, if a building like that, or <clears throat> I think there's a green, um, a green building down where Taylor Pay was, and there's a, I don't know if it's a pawn shop and a thermographic um, um, uh, place now in front of that in the stub. Like that residential property is gorgeous behind there that they've got this um, this brick stove on the front of it. So take take those kinds of uh, buildings and I think that are we trying to deal with those types of buildings within this or are they just MU, they become local landmarks if and when the time is is right, if they are eligible and then they're treated in the commercial code is that commercial I, code. that's in in my head i mean what you're describing every every situation you just described is is like the traditional historic mixed use structure to begin with right it's got the commercial storefront it's got the residence behind maybe it's even the, the home the the owner of that store um i mean that's that's the the model that we're trying to emulate in modern times right trying to encourage i think i to 
to draw a hard line and make something that makes sense for the user and the, you know, the municipality, I think it's logical to scoop up the zoning as your delineator because it's an established land use and the vast majority of M NMU, MU district structures are going to be commercial properties, even if they're not necessarily currently being used that way, it's still a legal use, but it will be used that way potentially in the future. And it will be treated as a commercial property if it were a planning board, zoning board action anyway. So why would, why would HPC treat it differently than as a commercial property? Uh, they're on Main Street. Theoretically, we would put emphasis on, on that maybe stronger than we might on Milton, just you know, because it's not as publicly visible or something. Um, so basically, so, uh, new design standards would be triggered on whether the property sh could potentially, well, whether, you know, I guess whether the property would have gone to planning board if an HPC wasn't there. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, so we could, I think that would be a relatively easy edit to our design standards to draw a line for when you're dealing with these residential districts to say for those properties that are currently zoned, that are zoned in, you know, fill in the blank, R1, R2, R3, maybe even R3M. I don't know, that might be pushed. I mean, I don't know if we even have anything in R3M that would be considered historic anyway. I mean, but, I don't think so. and R3M is gonna be higher density, more commercial residential anyway. Um, so maybe we just, Hold it well, to heck, one, two, Drexel and three. Hill all qualifies. <laughs> Drexel Hill all qualifies. <laughs> well, it's we'll, eligible. We'll it's old that. enough. I mean, it so is. is the Boulevard Mall. <laughs> <laughs> it is. You want, you want to nominate? <laughs> yeah. I don't um, know. It, seems like, it seems like zoning will be the controlling factor. It's the easiest thing. The yeah. zoning will, you know, we, we'll let the zoning be the controlling factor and then we'll respond from there. And you know, traditionally, I mean, this idea of commercial residential probably has a lot of history to it because I'm sure a lot of 19th century shopkeepers had their shop in the front and they were living upstairs or behind. Yeah, yeah. That's, that was Main Street. Uh, incidentally, um, museums and cultural uh, facilities other than churches are not permitted in the residential district. As a as a permitted okay. use by right, so if they wanted to turn it, if they wanted to turn the, the castle into a museum, they'd actually have to get a, a use variance, or they'd have to get a well, rezone. So, so do we need to talk about that language then in this? That do, do we want to do we want to stop the conversation on whether which which of these design standards that property goes to by listing as we start adding to this list of properties and then also take a retrospective list or look back at the current list of the we're deeming this as commercial bank of america it's commercial you know castle it's residential so it will always fall under which code we just, we just it's flat out there no matter if the zoning changes or not oh i see so like okay so in the spreadsheet, you would just have a column that says which code it falls. It makes it very easy for the user to understand. And then there's some kind of language in there that says, just no matter what the zoning is changed on this property, unless they're, you know, unless, well, no one would be able to like significantly alter it to a point where you couldn't determine that it was a residence or a... Right. I mean, yeah, I guess... So like, okay, so let's, let's play with the castle for a second. It's an interesting topic, right? So let's say they want to convert it to a museum property. And, um, you know, I think there'd probably be some support for that idea and whatever else, but um, they'd have to either get a use variance, which would be a very heavy burden, or they'd have to seek rezoning, which would probably be the, the easiest lift. 
and then they'd have to rezone it to some zoning that would be that would permit that use. Um, and so you're saying that from a preservation maintenance point of view, if you were to pr provide some sort of relief on a residential level, you would extend that relief to the, the owner of the castle, essentially forever, regardless of whether they rezoned it to some commercial-like use that would allow them to, to convert it over that way. But then what happens when they're no longer the owner and they get rid of, they decide to not make it a museum anymore, and now they have this rezoning and they can change it to some other use within that zoning, and now it's a much more commercial property, and oh, now we're going to do an addition. I mean, there's still have to come for C of A's. Arguably, arguably, I think you'd have the discretion at that time to maybe lean in heavier to the, the design standards at that point because they're they're really pushing the envelope away from residents or you know that kind of use. And and maybe at that point that's a bridge across. Um, so from that perspective, then I guess what you're saying is what you could almost do is I don't know if this is legal or not, but you could almost adopt it, nominate it based on, you know, that that alternate path and say, you know, we're nominating, you know, 75 Evans for, you know, compliance with residential design guidelines, you know, and then that would be, like you say, at the time that it's nominated and it's adopted, it's designated, that would be the time that it would be designated with that sort of mantle that R or C sort of. Matt, can I ask a question? Um, so if a zoning request comes up to the village board, does that trigger somebody to say, gee, I wonder what the HPC has to say about this? Does it go to us to look at too? Um, well, so zoning doesn't come to the village board. Zoning goes to the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, oh, okay. If it was a if it was a historic, if it was already a historically designated property, it would right. it would have to go through you as well, I would think. Um, well, what if it's not historically designated? Then it just goes to ZBA and that's it. Okay, nobody normally, says this looks normally like though the building, yeah the thing is generally speaking, Jim, the things that go to ZBA have nothing to do with preservation. Okay. Uh, uh. I just wondered if they might say, gee, I wonder if we, we should see what HPC has to say about this. Oh, they've I mean, never had. They've never, they've never okay. had. I mean, generally speaking, the, the, you know, what the type of things that ZBA would see that would overlap on HPC would be um, something that would have already triggered your involvement before it got to them. Somebody's doing an addition to a historic property or something like that. Or in now, someone's proposing a demolition of a property that's on the reconnaissance level survey or something. Um, and they also have a use variance that they're trying to get or whatever. But those two things are, tend to be mutually exclusive. Okay, I'm just trying to pick up on some of that stuff. Yep. Okay, so here is the exact section of this code that we currently have commercial use of residential and literally it's like one page like this is what you do so it's i'm not seeing i'm not seeing it all i'm seeing is the residential guidelines oh new share hold on um sorry there we go can you guys see it now commercial use of residential buildings no nope there it is yep okay so i mean the recommendations right now are avoid all to windows and doors on residential buildings used for commercial purposes. Be sure that commercial signage is in scale with the building and that its design and materials are compatible with the building's design. Refer, refer to signage section. Use signs as the primary means of indicating that a building has a commercial use, use of incompatible color or applied materials or ornament, ornaments is inappropriate. And okay. Okay, who's, who's going to update this thing? Because there's a typo have, right here. I have the, um, I have the word document. Okay, because there's a typo with that red line. Sure, where? Right oh. under the photograph. Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> Rai. Um, so, but, but this, we're, and we wouldn't deal with this at all. This would stay in yeah. commercial and we're not really focusing on edits to this unless it's drastic at this point. So right. the new document then will avoid commercial use of res residential buildings and um, they'll just keep keep being dealt with commercially. So I think that's important that to be able to, to minimize the information that we're giving to the residents as, and not and making it very plain and simple and not too much for them to, to deal with. Okay. Um, Kate, Kate, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> this is what happens when you're a bureaucrat for like so many years. There's another mistake in the uh, up above it says the see the buildings it, it's b-i-u-l-d right here buildings residential character it should be building a comma or apostrophe s because it's one single build where am i um commercial district is retained residential small scale town next sentence it is important that the buildings see it should be b-i-l the a past, uh, uh, right, that's the idea. The that the buildings... You're, you're, you're referring to one, a single one, instead of a plural one. The buildings, residential character. Not, not, it's not two buildings, it's one building. Okay, got it. Sorry, okay, I'll try to uh, watch it. <laughs> No, that's okay. No, this is a discussion. This is, you know, yeah. I'm not editing this by myself at home. I'm asking for input. Okay. okay. Um, so, well, let's go on to additions here. This is the next okay. chapter. So, if we were looking at this, um, the Obviously, the pictures we're going to have to, that's, that's something that's going to be, I think, big. We're going to need pictures to put as appropriate and appropriate um, for this document. It seems to be working pretty well uh, as a planning board tool, and it, I think it's done us well at the Historic Preservation um, Commission as well. So we're going to have to work on photo collections, and maybe Jim, you can, you can help us with that. Not so much as historic photo collections, taking new relevant photos from anywhere. They can be stolen from the internet and cited. Um, they can be you know, taken downtown in Kenmore, you know, Orchard Park, wherever we can find, you know, appropriate pictures of what we're trying to depict. And, you know, we, we can we can throw this in here. So obviously this this picture has nothing to do with the residential. Um, and I think that with this is where we can, you know, kind of look towards some of these other residential guidelines to make sure we have the wording correct. Um, I think, I mean, additions is obviously something that we're going to, to speak to, but we're going to try to focus that on anything that's visible from the street. So, I mean, it's, it's, that's the first line, you know, will it be visible from the street? And, you know, if it is, then the code enforcement officer says, okay, you're going for a C of any, but this is a landmark property. Um, hmm. I guess I would, I the question I might have would be um, the subjectivity associated with visibility from the street. So and we talked about, you know, is that in the winter? Is that in the summer? You know, is it with no no leaves on trees? Is it is it's it is it visible? I mean, if if I put an addition on the back of my house that extended the depth of my house in theory you can't see it from the street but i have a long driveway on one side now you can see the longer side of my house because of my driveway from the street if i if i'm not looking at it head on but i'm looking at it obliquely from an angle or my approach down the street i now see this addition on the side of the house even though it's officially the back so That'll be someone's question is what does visible from the street really mean? 
And I guess that's the question is, is it, is it head on or is it from all angles across, you know, 270 degrees? I think it, the, the decision um, at the last meeting sounded like it was from all angles. It wasn't a head on, it was, is it visible? So okay. it, from an oblique angle, it, that, that is, um, that's it as well. And I mean, that that's, brings up a good point. So if something is not visible from the street, so does that mean you could use, um, you know, a, an inappropriate material on some addition on your house? I guess so. I mean, if yes, it's not visible, it then, you know, you do whatever you want and paint it lime green. No one's going to, no one's going to say anything. But if yep. it is visible, then you do have to take into account, you know, getting a certificate of appropriateness and, and following the design guidelines and having that conversation with, with an HPC. Okay, I think, well, so then I, I think it's important that some language be added to the statement about visibility from the street to say from, you know, from all angles as you approach the property or something like that, you know. Or from adjacent oh, like properties. From the right of way. Yeah, but like, but, but, you know, I mean, people are going to say, well, hey, you know, I'm looking at my house from head on, you can't see the addition, but, you know, then people will say, well, but you can see it from over there. So it's just like, I don't know whether it's from, you know, visible from, you know, one property either direction down the sidewalk, even, or something like that, you know, some, some way to border it in that's rational that people understand oh look if i stand over here i can see it and now i understand why they're making my, my well that brings up a, an interesting point um emily garrett brought up you know she lives next to the, the stone house and you know she's like who approved the addition on the back of that and we're like well, we did and she's like well i have to look at that thing and you know it's uh it's you know, not particularly historic looking so but, I, that's from a private resident, not from the right of way. It, it, well, that's where we didn't think about that long and hard enough because it actually is from the public right of way. Oh, is it? So, probably a faux pas on our point, our, our, our part, but we're here learning. We're trying to learn from our mistakes. Um, so, I mean, are, are we here to protect the neighbors as well from what their neighbor could do to do to a property that they thought they're moving to us, you know, in, in next to a historic property? I mean, it, we probably shouldn't get into to that because, you know, people don't want to hear that for, for the most part, unless you're really particular about what kind of property you live next to. But, yeah. So yeah, we'll definitely have to clean up that language so that it's it's pretty concise and there's no question. Okay. Um, so going back to what? Okay, so this is back to those um, Salt Lake City design standards. So what's different from ours is then they they bring out in chapters things like a porch, whereas we have it all under chapter four. There's just elements, and we just give a blurb about each one. Here they, they, you know, they make each one, I think, a little easier to find. You got a porch, you got a roof, you have an addition. Um, I kind of just like the way that they, they brought these out very specifically. They talk about the accessory structures. We'll have to be very clear about if it's visible from the public right of way at any angle. Hey, yeah. can I bring up one other point? Sure. Okay. So we were talking about viewable from the street the last meeting not street public right of way okay what i was getting at was adding public property because i think you brought up the point that if you're on island park you can see the back of these residences and right. so maybe not only from the street but from public property right and i yeah i mean i i would agree i mean the 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 I think the legal language is the public right of way, but I think if there are special situations, we can add like a separate clause that says, you know, or from, you know, existingly existing established public lands, you know, 
on all sides. Right. I mean, so that's the point I was getting know, at. Is that sharing a property line. Or, public property. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I'm going to just, I can see these things coming up in the future sometime. So the meeting house. So the parks. So, I mean, we're talking about one park. You know, those, uh, the train depot is leased, but you know, it's technically owned by a village. Those, those properties in the village that are being used by the village or rented by the village, um, you know, are, how are those dealt with in these scenarios as far as how you can use something? So, so you have two historic properties, right? I think, no, it's not local's property next to the meeting house. Um, but say that building next to the meeting house was deemed a local landmark, either side. Um, would then the side view of those become fair game for something? <laughs> because it's adjacent to it's public property. property. Yeah. Right. So um, I want to be clear about this. So that I mean, these are things that come up. They, they, yeah. They do. I, uh, I think I I think the short answer would be yes. I think the longer answer is is that it's probably already visible from the public right of way anyway. So it's a bit moot. Probably. Uh, in that example. Um, uh, some of the some of these I things, think, Kate, I think are things where as Matt was alluding to, this gets approved and it gets amended as different things come up. No, yeah. no, no, no. We are trying to no. avoid that because okay. that's why things slip through the cracks because right. there are things that, oh, we should have dealt with, but we didn't. And, you know, and somehow there's some loophole where, oh, well, we lost. Well, I thought, Matt, I thought that was okay. your point is to get this approved and then later on you no, my, my, my point was simply that the, as, a, as a design guideline, as opposed to a code, it can be a living document. So it can be amended over time to address other things and more easily without, with only, a, with only a, um, a motion by the board as opposed to a public hearing. Okay. Um, the, uh, um, it's, it's just, it's a semantic issue. But um, I think to Kate's point, I mean, it is, it is wise to try and, you know, catch as many eggs in the basket as you can, but we can also find ourselves suffering from paralysis by analysis if we spend too much time thinking of all the if comes and trying to resolve every single issue because you you won't be able to do it. It's just it's not possible. This as soon as you think you've got them all, something new will come up. I guess that's where absolutely. I absolutely yeah. absolutely. But if we're gonna if we're we're gonna be very precise about the language of public right of way, public property, you know, I don't yeah. want something that is interpreted by a code enforcement officer later of, oh, that wasn't the intent. Right, right. We're, yeah, I mean, we have a lot of ambiguity built into our, into our code right now. It's frustrating and, and, uh, and, you know, it seems like all I've done since I've become a trustee is work to resolve a lot of that ambiguity, but it will just continue. Um, so they go through seismic retrofitting. I'd have to see exactly what that is. But that brings up, we talked about solar and historic buildings before, and we're definitely, we were, I've been asked during this process about South so Cayuga, would we be allowed to add solar panels to our house? And the answer is, of course you would, you know. Um, you know, look at the placement. I can tell you right now who, who's going to be highly beneficial from solar and whose house is not orientated the right way, and it's just not going to work, or not going to work really beneficially. So, um, well, you know. but I mean, to that point though, I mean, so what, I mean, so they want to do it anyway. I mean, that's, that's their call. If they want to, if they want to invest five grand in putting solar panels on that are only 80% efficient, then so be it. The bigger question is, are they going to run into a problem with you guys? Because you say, well, it's not, a, it's not as efficient as it should be. But well, I think removable. there's a difference though, between solar panels that are added that are removable and maybe a solar shingle that would be a treatment yes. of a roof. So I think we need to talk about that, that, that kind of, you know, of detail. Um, just so, you know, so people can read it and make their plans. I mean, that's the whole point of this, is so that they can read it and know where, what, what this commission and board were thinking at that time and what, they're, what there's, they have carte blanche to do and what they, you know, we should have a discussion about. 
Um, okay. Um, they do talk about landscaping here. And I think at our last meeting, we talked about, now Matt, tell me if we're missing anything. We talked about just eliminating landscaping altogether from. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, I, you know, I don't, I just don't, I don't get it. I mean, I guess I, I understand it on a commercial property. It's an income property, blah, blah, blah. But I mean, a homeowner should be able to go out and tear out their bushes on a Saturday and plant some new stuff on a Sunday. And they're going to do it every couple of years and they shouldn't have to ask permission. Now you said something interesting. You said homeowner. So we've got buildings in this proposed district that are rental units. Mm -hmm. So? So okay. it is the tenant, the occupant, the okay. occupant, fill in the blood. So, I mean, the point is, if they have if they have permission to go out there and tear out the landscaping and redo it from the property owner, then they might as well be the homeowner. I agree, Matt, but it would be interesting to do some research. And if somebody approached us and said, gee, what kind of, you know, vegetation was typical of, you know, the mid-19th century or so, and, and come up with some guidance as to, you know, I mean, I grow heirloom vegetables in my garden. You know, what what plants were historically correct for that period? I'm not precluding the, uh, the opportunity for a resident or an architect to, to, to ask your opinion on something. Right. I'm yeah, saying they shouldn't be required to. Right. I agree. I agree. I'm just so saying. Does that mean, can we just make this simpler and just not address landscaping, though? If they have questions, they can ask us. But right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I take Let's it just out. not even address it. Take it yeah. out. I mean, the truth is, I'd probably ask Frank Mishler first. You know. <laughs> Okay, and then as far as we only have two people here, but um, they're on the board, um, commission, uh, the commission, but like polar, we, we're, we're just going to eliminate that and not talk about it, right? Sorry, you, you cut out. You're going to eliminate what? Uh, the any discussion about color. Yeah, Correct. That, that seemed to be the consensus, yes. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I, think, I think the statement the statement that's in the existing design guideline there, you know, recommending that color be, you know, I forget how it's phrased. It's it's pretty, you know, nebulous about how it should be. Yeah, but like the point is, is that that can still, that could be in there. It can be a recommendation, but someone doesn't have to come for a C of A to paint their shingles, you know. My my house has or had, <laughs> it still does, but they're under vinyl siding. But it had cedar shingles that someone painted long before I ever bought the house. Worst thing they ever did because cedar cedar shingles don't cold paint. We couldn't. We hadn't even paid off the loan to get the house painted before we needed to paint it again. <laughs> so it's like, you know, it, it, I couldn't possibly imagine coming to HPC every three years to say I'm painting my house again you know and i don't think you guys want to even entertain the conversation i toyed with uh, actually um replacing our shingles with cedar shingles because that was what was actually used in the house in the 1920s but the roofer said a i don't have anybody that really knows how to install those and b they don't last very long <laughs> yeah you know i don't think we're recommending cedar shingles to anybody right yeah no. Um, okay. Do you guys see when I'm scrolling or no? Or is it just a one-time screenshot? Uh, I, I see a scrolling. I see a okay. scrolling, yeah. Okay. Um, so then there's a whole section on new construction. That's another thing I want to talk about. Um, so it's possible that between the time when these these design standards were adopted and um, the local landmarking, if it ever happens, of this district, that there could be a property or two or you know that are demolished because the code allows for it, and you know something new could go in its place. Something already did have to happen. You know, on the street, and it's possible it could happen again. 
um, do we want to talk about new construction or how do we want to handle it moving forward? I think it's, I, well, think I guess it's the first, I guess the first question is, you know, you, your purview is, uh, either designated properties or district. So anything related to new construction would be limited to those two criteria, right? So arguably speaking, let's say, let's say South Cayuga district is established, right? There's at least as many non-contributing structures in there as there are contributing. And someone wants to tear down one of the ones that's not contributing. They would have to get a C of A from you guys to get the demo done anyway. And then they'd be arguably up against it for you guys for new construction anyway, because you're the only game in town and it's in the district. So the trouble is that we do not have in the village residential design standards for new construction at all, only commercial. So um, theoretically then anything that would be proposed by that applicant would be, this is what we want to do. And then you say, yeah, well, we don't like your crazy pseudo mid-century Jetsons house. And, you know, we want you to change it completely. And basically it just becomes a pissing match between opinions. So it probably would be a good idea to have some form of new construction um, standard for residential properties that are already designated. You would not be able to impress those on anyone anywhere just because, though. So, Matt, like house on Mill Street that was constructed. Yep. And then, they didn't consult the village at all. The village, the village had no say as to what that house was going to look like. Only, Correct. Only there's, the zoning. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Zone, so the, uh, yeah. The only. Design. Yeah. There's no. There's no residential design standards, and okay. the the only thing that um, is required is is land use zoning and to, you know setbacks, front yard setbacks, side yard setbacks, I gotcha. I gotcha. and and building height. So okay. if an architect designs a building that fits inside those dimensions, yeah. they get a building permit. They're done. Yeah, okay. All right. Just I'm just trying to clarify. Okay. Yep. And it doesn't matter how ugly it is. <laughs> oh, so it doesn't okay. that that building's very lovely. You know, as is the one on the corner of Eagle. They did a really nice job with it and everything. But um Everybody has different views on those things. I, I guess I like the stonework on it. it, it it's kind of an interesting stone work but not everybody shares that opinion i know right and then you know the other interesting thing too is so let's use 87 mil as an example so that's an interesting thing in that that property that house isn't designated right or 95 mil is designated but um the house next to it which they created by subdividing the lot is no longer under that designation that new construction mm -hmm still goes on without, you know, within the confines of regular village law. Okay. Um, if, if the stone wall on 95 mil had been designated, you know, last year and they subdivided it and that was now a feature on the site, it wouldn't trigger this because the property is not historic just that feature. Okay. Right? The only thing it would have done was protected that better. So how do we take the language in the district where if a subdivision occurs, that new property still falls under the guidelines of that district to make sure that new construction or whatever the other guidelines that it would be triggering are triggered? Um, I don't know, it's a great question. Um, I'm not sure, I mean, right now, based on the districts that have been identified in the, in the, um, 
uh, reconnaissance survey, you don't have any properties big enough to subdivide. I mean, the only the only property on South Cayuga that could potentially, you know, really trigger that to a serious situation would you be. You could flagship all of them. What do you mean? You could flagship them. What does that mean? To take a driveway back and build a house in the back. I mean, lots of them have been flagship. Oh, flag lot. Yeah. Well, yeah. In the That's town true, of but you can't actually. You can't. You can't because that would be prohibited by zoning. And in Amherst, they used to call it a special use permit, I think. Yeah, we have special use permits, not, but not for flag lots. The, the, okay. they actually, that actually is what held up the, um, the chicken coop property, was that the, they attempted to subdivide that property in two pieces, and neither one of them was compliant with the with requirements of the zoning code, which is what brought mm -hmm. them to us to begin with. Um, uh, they were able to get themselves out of that by building the, the house on the chicken coop footprint. And then all they needed was the frontage variance. Um, but they did want to create a flag lot. Flag lots are almost ex almost by by writing exempted from uh, permission. They're, they're not permittable by right. I so, feel like there are quite a few though properties, let's say on South Cayuga or even on some other properties that have been identified recently to us. Um, that are very large lots for the village. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, undoubtedly. Uh, you know, the, the, the properties along Cayuga on the creek side are super deep. I mean, they're three, four, five hundred feet deep. From well, I mean, even road. wide with frontage, where you could, if something happened to the house, let's say, you know, something terrible happens, you know, and, and now there's a need for rebuilding. Obviously, mm -hmm. may, they wouldn't be required from us to rebuild the same house. So they're pro I mean, most homeowners don't rebuild the same exact house they have. They take, right. you know, take this as an opportunity to do something different. So mm -hmm. maybe at that time they just said, well, we don't need the width of this lot. We can actually build two narrower houses back and still meet all the zoning requirements. So I just want to make sure that we well, use the right language that, you know, yeah. property, this, is the, this is the designated boundary. So anything within the boundary has to fall under the opposite uh, um, I think that's I think that's really your trigger. I mean, I think that's the point is that it doesn't even matter how they break up the properties or whatever or what what necessitates the new construction. The point is new construction. And I guess the question also is does new construction specifically relate to something from the ground up or is this I don't you know obviously not having read St. Louis's thing here is this also grabbing all of those other chapters that they talked about with regards to porches and windows and other and roofs and things um, and condensing that all into one chapter or is this specifically referring to a new house as opposed to an addition? This, this is just a new house. Okay. An addition. All right. So then, so then arguably speaking then it, it should be relatively simple to say that any new construction within the boundaries of a residential residentially designated historic district would have to comply with chapter 12. Okay. I guess the question becomes, does chapter 12, I mean, that's a heavy lift. Um, but only what's seen from the public way. Well, right, and you don't you don't want to create conflicts with the existing zoning either, especially if the zoning changes over time. So, like in here, they've got height and width and mass and scale and you know all the stuff. So, you'd want to you'd want to steer clear of anything that was zoning related, you know, um, or petition the board to create, you know, some sort of special zoning classification or something. But I don't think you'd want to get that deep. I wonder if new construction doesn't just trigger absolutely everything in the design guideline. You know, rather than all the gimmies for residential, it's like, okay, you're starting from scratch. We get a say in everything. Interesting. Okay. 
Okay. Oh, I, I just want to like please double advocate of how that's perceived by the village board when they're looking at to, to ratify this, or codify it, or whatever you guys are going to do. Um. So I mean, they'll say, well, it's muddy waters. So this is a residential structure and not a commercial structure. Um. Mm -hmm. So would it still fall under these guidelines? Like. You'd still use this manual, but we specifically say that when we have our little chart of this is the process, new construction goes right for sketch review with the, the HPC, so that we, we get ahead of full architect drawings or, or you know, yeah. measured drawings, anything like that. That's an right. interesting point. Right. Maybe, um, um, you know, Matt's on to something. I mean, just if it's new construction, the whole thing applies. And then you don't have to worry specifically about chapter 12. Right. We don't have to write a whole new thing that it will, will end up arguably saying a lot of the same stuff anyway. So, you know, I, I think if you, in you know, that flow chart, I, again, this would, this would apply to established historic districts or properties, right? So um, within that flow chart, the presumption is is that you already know you're in a district or a historic property and you know you're talking about new construct the key is to, to differentiate new construction as wholesale versus in part yeah, that's what, where you the could, what you could do is just explain in the introduction or someplace that any new construction the entire guidelines is, is, is comes into play yeah, I know. So does but, that but, mean color and lands? No, no, we're not going to do color. Take it out. Oh no, no, that's what I'm saying. Is I think, I think that's the point. I mean, so let's. We already let's, took out color. No, no, no. no, no, no. But Jim, now they're going back to the other process. Right. So, so let's play out the scenario. Right. Let's say South Cayuga is created as a district. Right. It's created as a district, arguably because the village board voted in favor of that because there was community support for it and it and the 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 preservation of that neighborhood both physically and culturally was deemed important and significant for forever right now the threat to that consistency that that neighborhood comes in the form of a house fire and house burns down and people are forced to rebuild right well they're not going to rebuild the brady mansion now because they like the way you know the brady bunch lived they're going to come to hpc because they're in a district and everything is up for grabs now i mean so you don't get to build a green house. Maybe later, here's the thing, arguably speaking, once it's constructed, they default back to the residential standards moving forward. But you get to set it up ahead of time. You get the say up front that says, we want this to have high quality materials. We want it to be, you know, consistent architectural style with the vintage of the neighborhood, you know, things like that. And you get a decent looking, you know, two-story gable with, with, you know, hardy plank siding on it and it's color fast and they, they, it's not pink and polka dots. And everybody's happy and you move on. I just don't see how you can like not comment on the color if it's not new construction a comment on the color if it is new construction <laughs> it seems like it's not consistent it, it, well i don't think it is <laughs> I, I mean you're gonna either color in or color out i think and landscape too you, you're gonna say to them okay it's new construction so we do get to comment on the landscape I think I agree with Jim. I don't think you comment on the things that we take out of the residential code. Okay. Well, I mean, how can you? Well, so then, so I guess the point is, is that there, there really is no restriction on new construction. No, I'm not saying that. 
I'm saying the things that we take out, like the subjective things like ladies, anything in color, those things that go, but things like material choices and, um, and just mass in general, I mean, those things that we still need to do. The things that are identified, you know, under here, but those I mean, are already that's, that's already baked into your design guidelines. I mean, that's already there already. And if they're if they're already a designated parcel, then they have to come to you anyway. That's the point of if it's new construction, the whole guidelines apply, and, and so then you do get to comment on the windows and all those things. But that's but but, but those are uh, to Kate's point. Driving the line between residential and commercial, you have a handful of things on the residential side that are less applicable, and they remain less applicable if you're building a new residence. But you still have control over those that list, no matter what. Well, that's the thing about having new construction apply the guideline apply to new construction. Yeah, but I mean, yeah. I think that's the point is that, is that <sighs> if, I, if I live in the South Cayuga district uh, and I tear down one of the non-contributing non structures, structures, I would have to get a demo permit to do that. And I'd have to come to you guys anyway. And you'd probably tell me I'm not allowed to do it. At which point I burn my house down and I build one on the building. Right, right. But if you say in these <laughs> guidelines that new construction has to follow these guidelines, then it's covered, right? That's yes, that's my point. Right. So, 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 so I don't we, think we, my, I guess my, my, the gist of what I'm trying to say is that we don't need a separate chapter for that because you have the whole guideline and all you need to do is just parse out what's residential and what's not. That's what I am saying too. Let it roll. I, thought that's, I thought that's what we agreed on about 10 minutes ago. Yeah. yeah. Well, but, but if someone has a contributing structure, they, when you look at something like windows, you're probably going to be looking for, you know, what light over what light are, do they originally have, you know, could they replace them with that same look? Could they replace them with, we, we would ask them if they could replace them with the same material or ask for what she what they would like to. From the streak, does it have the same width possibly of, of the mullions? You know, what it looks like from the street, whereas new construction, even though it was, um, it's in a district, it wouldn't necessarily have to be a historic looking home and therefore would vinyl windows just be okay in a non-contributing new construction. Whereas if you were in the design stand for contributing structure, you know, maybe it would possibly say there are no vinyl exteriors are allowed you know, without, without some kind of vapor or something, you know, with a new material. I think if you try to think about every possible thing that, that could come up, we'll never get these guidelines. No, 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 no. I don't, I don't think these are, these are for thinking what, what could come up. I think this is the meat of the, of the product. I think, you know, if, if, if there's going to be, um, new construction, then, you know, the, the, I think you gotta say what it is right away. Like these are, these are, these are the guidelines. All right, they're the guidelines. That's it. Right, I mean, so I guess, if, if you're maybe, even maybe, maybe standards it's, for new construction. Maybe it's procedural uh, to your point, to your example there, Kate. Maybe it's a, it's a flow chart issue, you know, the, um, if you're building a new, new residence in a designated, you know, district, then you come to sketch plan with HPC and HPC decides right then and there that they don't care about vinyl windows and, and all the stuff that they're really more interested in sort of the general aesthetic, the general massing. Are you proposing something that's, you know, 
wildly different than the historic district and is that okay or does it want to be more you know uh complementary and you know whatever else and then maybe that's it maybe that's all you get is you get you get first crack at it to say you don't care and then you're out or if they say you know you, you want or or at that moment you say you know what we do want in and we like where you're heading with this and we really think you should do this that and the other thing and here's some guidelines that you should follow and blah 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 and you get you you start a conversation then maybe that's the way to do it too and there isn't necessarily a code procedure for this it's really the only code issue is they have to talk to you about it before they get too far because you're the governing agency in this case I think we need to look for more examples on this one. I think we need to look, look specifically at how, uh, how other people handle it, have, have handled it. Um, I'm worried about there being too much ambiguity of boards making decisions on the fly of these are the rules for one property and not for another. I like it being, I like rules. So I like it being, you know, across the board, everybody should follow the same rules and, you know, that's, easier for my black and white mind to, to handle and and therefore take the element of you treated me differently you know that you know finger pointing afterwards i'd rather have up, be up front with the applicants so let's let's keep looking at this one maybe the way matt said is the way we should go but let's 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 bet this one um for our discussion next time it is 13 after we've gone beyond what i said that we would do um I, I like the way this one is set up. I do like the chapter 12, having new construction all by itself to be, um, you know, to give more information to somebody that could be considering new construction or just the case comes up later on. I mean, we don't even know where these districts are all gonna be when we're set and done. There's other ones that are, you know, were, as I'm learning, were identified by Arrow that didn't make it to the final document. So it's, you know, we, we got to take a closer look at the entire village and, and see, you know, were there any more? Maybe that's just a simple conversation with Kathy Howe of, you know, where else were you thinking that there should be districts that didn't make it into that um, document? Kate, so where do we go from here? Are we going to have another meeting to keep? We'll have another meeting. We already have a public hearing meeting set for, um, for next month. And the night we're talking about 75 Evans for um, a public hearing for that. So, I mean, obviously these are not, these meetings are not well attended, but I think this was very, very useful to keep the process going. So I appreciate both of your time. No um, problem. I, I think we should mind schedule doing it again in a couple meeting. weeks. I think maybe another special meeting just to, to keep this discussion going. I think so. And, I, and I'd like to okay with you because you guys are the only ones here you know i'd like to take a little stick at, you know, putting together a mock um like because i don't really want to i don't really want to take this document and try to regurgitate it I, I think that's almost the wrong thing to do i don't think it's an edit anymore i really think it's kind of here's our sections let's put together introductions what we want what we don't kind of take them from different places and create the document we want not this is the one we have let's try to modify it because I mean, it's just not working for me anyway. Um, so if you can, you know, send me ahead of time, you know, what, um, you know, a model that you really like, especially from a section, like maybe it's a new construction section. You know, I'd like to, if there were more people here tonight, I'd almost like to say, hey, everybody take a specific chapter and find one you really, really like or two and circle parts that you like and let's try to meld this together and see what we end up with. Um, but, you know. So, Kate, are you saying, uh, are you saying take this one that you've been going over and, and see how we can modify this for our use? Is that the? Well, this one, I like the way that the table of contents is set up. So okay. I'm going to, you know, kind of pull that out. But I'm um, like, so there's accessory structures, you know, there's, there's top, topic button, um, hot button topics in here that we're just going to really need to vet and think through because like all of those accessory structures are visible from the islands for South Cayuga. So how do we handle those? So maybe okay. so if you want to base it on this, 
if you want to base it on this, can you email me this document and I'll look over this document? Sure, sure, I can do that. But I don't want to necessarily base it just on this. I would like to, you know, let's keep doing our research and find the best section on solar that you can find. You know, these topics we've been talking about, let's find the best sections we can about from different documents and try to pull them together, just an easy cut and paste into a document, and we'll start modifying from there. Sound good? All, all I did was search um, residential historic design standards, and a lot came up, a lot. Yeah, I think we're going to be overwhelmed if you keep, like, adding, uh, well, let's look at these municipalities dying standards and then now look at let, let's look at the I mean if you're kind of happy with this one why don't we just base it on what will it'll just be chaotic if we're trying to pull things from different cities and put them together I mean if yeah, this I you know having having done this for a couple of times it usually takes at least two or three examples to to pull together something that hits everything because everybody doesn't hit it exactly the same and you find tidbits in different places dozens and dozens agreed it's two it's 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 white noise but if we okay. found two or three good examples and we could mesh them together not discrediting i might add our own i mean as one of those examples i mean there's ours is fine it you may not be happy with the way it's set up or we want to push and pull it or reorganize it or whatever but i mean i don't want to i don't want to start redrafting the whole thing from scratch either but I definitely agree there are areas that could be reinforced or modified or spread out or whatever. Kate, um, Kate, just to try to achieve precision on this a little bit. So, so mm -hmm. why don't we say three, that this is one of them from Salt Lake City. Uh, ours is another one from the village of Williamsville. And then why don't, I mean, you, you're the expert. Why, why don't you find one other one that you think is worth considering Let's do two more. Sure. Let me do that. I'll find two more and, you know, All right. so, maybe so I can even start mashing together and we can have a really fine, you know, discussion and handle this all in the next hour. So, so, we, so we can agree on a maximum of four, right? We're not going to go above yeah. four. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, why don't you email us the other ones so we have all four of them and that we can look over and then we can do a kind of what you're talking about. Okay. Um, yes, I'll send Ooh. you the links. And I'm going to kind of just try to put them together into a document that we can, you know, by windows, you know, you know, start handling the major topics um, from like a, a mock or a draft table contents that I put together. You're going to put links. Yeah, of course. You're going to send us links to four different guidelines is that what you're going to do yeah it won't be tonight i don't know no, no, okay. i mean just so i know what we're doing you're, you're sending links to four different guidelines and those are the ones we're going to look over yep. yes but our yeah. ours is on our website so i'll just um right i don't care about it i mean i've got ours it's the other ones and then what we can do is look over those three other ones in addition to the village of waynesville's Okay, click on that link there, uh, Kate. What? This? In the, in the, in the chat. This? Yeah, I can send no, no, no. In, in the chat that just popped oh. up. Oh, sorry. I don't have that on my screen. Hold on. Stop sharing. Here we go. Chat. Yeah. Let me share screen again. Hold on. If I can get to that. Share screen. It's really creepy that that picture of Keaton is staring at He set it up for us, so he just... I know. We, we can't, uh, can't, can't overlook um, NPS here. They actually have a whole website yeah. on. Oh, that's perfect. Um, yeah, let me read through this, too. I didn't even, I don't know why I didn't think to go here. Well, yeah. And definitely, you know, the same as what we have now, we're going to be linking to all of the applicable standards in the back. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Definitely. Okay, right. let's end because we were way over. I, yep. I really appreciate you guys' time. This was
extremely useful. Let's um let's pick a next date since uh, we're here. So in two weeks would be the fourth of May. Um, I don't know if Thursday nights yeah. as well. Um, or if you guys want to do a different night. Uh, Thursday's fine. Try the fourth. Sure. Okay. Let's um. Do you want to do what time did we start? Seven. That was Tony's suggestion. Tony, what didn't join us? Do we want to do six thirty or does seven work? Six thirty is fine. Okay, let's do six thirty. Six thirty, and we'll try to keep it to an hour. Um. Okay. All right, and Jim, I will try. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, June fourth at six thirty, right? Yeah. Okay. And I'll try to get those links out in the next couple of days to give you plenty of time to look over them. That would be good. And I'll print them out and I'll start looking them over and stuff. And um, Matt, within the next few days, uh, well, I'll look at these photographs. And if I have any ones with the walls, I'll email them to Matt or Kate. Okay. Oh, that'd be great. Okay. Thank you. All right. We're all set. Okay. All right. Thanks, everybody. Enjoy your long weekend. Thanks, Thank you, you. too. Bye. So how do I? Uh, there we go.